Greetings everyone. Welcome back into Calc 2. Time to start the next unit, which is going to be all about curves and uh, calculus in space, basically. Uh, we'll be building up our knowledge of graphable and uh, linkable and usable curves, which include lines, but are not just that. We'll be upgrading into 3D space when possible. And we'll even get into uh, a lot of the vector analysis that comes in. Um, and it's sort of like a build up to multivariable calculus from here on out. All of the stuff in these next uh, unit or two uh, worth of material is all about getting ready for that uh, higher level of thinking with multidimensional calculus. Okay, so the, the first thing we wanna step into is what we call conic sections. And that's because these are very, very popular, very common curves that come from some straightforward equations, okay? So a conic section is exactly what the name describes. It's a section of a cone. And some of you may not realize what a cone actually is. A cone is both the top and the bottom of this shape that I've drawn here. A cone that you're accustomed to seeing with an ice cream cone is actually only half of a cone, technically. So what I have here is the full, uh, what we call a cylindrical cone. Okay, it's the top and bottom halves here. Okay, now a section is when I take a sheet, a plane, okay, and I slice into this cone. And there are all manner of curves that occur whenever I take this cone and slice a plane into it. And that's what we wanna talk about in this section. Okay, now the ones that you've already seen, a point, okay? If I slice a plane into the middle of this thing right here, they will only intersect at a point. So a point technically is a conic section, but you already know all about those, okay? Basically we treat them as circles with a zero radius. A line is what happens whenever your plane skirts through the middle and just grazes the outer edge of the cone. And again, from this equation, by the way, this is the generic conic section equation. Everything that's possible uh, from a, um, a degree two and a degree one and a degree zero. Degree two are A, B, and C. Degree one are D and F, uh, E. And then F is degree zero. Okay, so conic sections cover every one of our uh, equations uh, that could be degree two, okay? Now all the ones that we're gonna talk about here, when they're degree two, we're gonna either have A or B or both. I'm not gonna really be talking about the C, the mixture term here, X, Y. Those have to do with rotating these things, and that's for a, a later lecture, okay? <clears throat> so what happens with a line is all you're getting is either D, E, or F, or a combination of those to get those equations. Uh, if you wanna see a more in-depth lecture on lines, go uh, and look in my college algebra section. I spent uh, a good lecture or two on those, talking about all of the ins and outs of lines and those equations. Okay, another common one that if, you, if you're not familiar with, definitely go take a look at the lecture I have on uh, distance formula and circle equations in the college algebra form. Okay, you definitely should be familiar with circles at this point. Um, and if you're feeling rusty, I urge you to go take a look in my college algebra lecture series. Okay, a circle happens whenever you take your plane and slice through the middle, but parallel with either the top or the bottom. If it's completely parallel with the top surface, you're going to get a circle. Okay. Now, once you start leaning the plane and start slicing into the cone at an angle, your, your circle starts to ovulate, right? Become ovular, become an oval. But the actual word for this is an ellipse. We get this oval shape called an ellipse. And what happens with that is with a circle, the, the, the numbers in front of our squared terms are gonna be the same. And then, but they're gonna be the same sign is more important. In an ellipse, the, the A and B, the two squared terms, are going to be 
the same sign still, but notice they're not the same number anymore. So it's like X or Y, one of them is gonna have a little bit more treatment than the other, right? A little bit more um, contribution. Uh, so right here, notice X squared and Y squared, they're both negative. That means it's an ellipse uh, because four and five are not equal in size. Next, if you continue to lean your plane and slice, but the plane uh, leaves the side and starts slicing through one side and then out through the top here, then what you're going to get is a parabola, okay? Because one end of your ellipse is gonna open up once, it, once the intersection hits that top surface there. And so you're going to get this parabola uh, right here. And basically what's happening with that is anytime your plane goes past being parallel with the side of the cone, right? So when it is parallel and it goes to the middle, you get a line. When you move it a little bit, you get the ellipses either way. When you move, when you tilt it past parallel, it starts to become parabolic. So with a parabola, what's happening is you get one squared term or another, not both. So to move from ellipse to parabola, you lose one of your squared terms, okay? But you still have one of them and then the, the first power of the other one. So in this case, 3x squared plus y plus 7 equals 0. And I'm sure you've seen parabolas before also in an algebra course. But the way that we're going to write ours here are more along the lines of what we call the curve version rather than just the function, okay? There are some other attributes of parabolas that we expand out to uh, in this section. Okay, and then when you start to lean this enough and your plane uh, gets past even a little bit further there, you'll notice that what will happen is the plane will start to slice into both the top and bottom, but not through the middle. So like this, or, or actually I have it drawn right here like this, right? So what you get is a top and bottom piece or a left and right piece, depending on which way you, you want to look at it. A hyperbola will be two of these curves that will sort of look parabolic, but hyperbola curves are slightly different than parabolas. Parabolas are wider, and hyperbola curves are uh, asymptotic. They actually have asymptotes governing those outer edges, okay? So the, the shape on hyperbolas is distinctly different than a parabola's uh, curvature, okay? And you'll know that you have a hyperbola when your A and B terms are opposite in sign. Uh, they don't have to be the same size, but in this case, the example I have here, one and one, but one and negative one actually, right? That gives you a, a hyperbola when the two squared terms are opposite in sign, okay? In this lecture, I want to focus on ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas. Well, actually, parabolas, ellipses, then hyperbolas in that order, okay? Uh, uh, like I said, if you're interested in circles and lines, I already have lectures on those. Please, please visit those. Some good stuff there, okay? I want to start with the treatment of things that we don't have any exposure to or not enough exposure to, okay? So that's parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas, okay? Before then, go take a look at what this looks like in GeoGebra, uh, and then, then we'll jump into parabolas. So here you can see where I'll use a plane to slice a cone and uh, create the different conic sections in a, in a visual manner here. Uh, so I've got my plane slicing into uh, the center of the cone right now, as you can see, their intersection, which I have lit up in the, in the darker blue, is a point. And if I were to move the plane up or down, their intersection becomes a circle. From there, uh, let me move it up a little more so you can see. Um, from there, if I were to tilt the plane a little bit, you can see that the circle becomes more ovular, more like an oval, and it's what we call an ellipse. And the, the ellipses can have all the variety of shapes, just like uh, circles and whatnot. You can have a really elongated ellipse like so. 
but if you lean it too much and up here at the upper end of the ellipse if this uh, opposite point goes too far out then it actually becomes a parabola like so you went too far for a second there uh, so it becomes a parabola if you go out too far well too far is not the right word if you go out far enough you can see the other end extends outward now because uh, we're beyond being parallel uh, the side of the cone with the uh, plane there and uh, that's the other thing also if if you have this thing centered you can also create the line by having this uh, at the perfect angle that's parallel with the side of the cone as you can see at this particular intersection it's just a single line and that's how lines become uh, one of the technical conic sections even though we don't really talk about it much <clears throat> Okay, so so now then for the last uh, conic section, you can see what happens when the plane is such an angle that it actually can slice through both the top and bottom halves uh, of the of the cone, like so. And what you get is that hyperbolic shape, which is the, the two half uh, curves that are, they look like a, a parabola, each one, but they're actually different than a parabola uh, because a parabola is not bound the same way these are. These are very uh, bound by the, the actual surface of the, the cone here. And when we're sketching these out, they'll actually have asymptotes, whereas a parabola uh, does not. First, parabolas. You've probably seen a lot of parabolas in your algebra days leading in through all the way through Calc 1 and everything. But now it's time to fill out the rest of the information about parabolas. They're used in quite a few uh, real world applications because of their very special properties. The reflective property being one of them we're gonna talk about in a second. But first, a parabola, what it really is, is a collection of points that are equidistant from a point and a line given in space, okay? So that point is called a focus, and the line is called a directrix. And if you take any point along this parabola, and see I have them drawn out, um, and if you do the distance perpendicular with the line, and directly from the parabola to the focus, those two lengths are equal. See, and same thing here, those two lengths are equal, and here those two lengths are equal. So a parabola is a collection of those such points that are equidistant from a focus point and a directrix line. So there's, there's really two flavors here. There's the vertical kind that we study a lot, especially with functions. And then there's also the horizontal kind that we study a little less often in algebra. But in this unit, you'll notice we're going to start building up more of our horizontal type of graphs and move away from the, um, the shun that used to be put on these kinds of things because they were told they were not a function uh, when actually we have a very good way of making them uh, functions and bringing them into our function world. Uh, a lot more of these uh, types of curves. So, so that's why one reason why we didn't study these two. Okay, so either way, uh, you have what's called the lattice rectum, which is the line that goes through the focus and hits either side of the parabola. And you'll have the same thing here too, it's just it would be vertical here. The lattice rectum is a length of four times what we call the focal length. So the focal length is what I've labeled as P here, 
Okay, that's the focal length. It's the length from the focus to the vertex of the actual parabola, the peak point on the parabola. And the lattice rectum is actually a measurement of four times this large. I know it's not drawn the scale here, but whatever this distance here is, this distance that's perpendicular to it is four times it. And that's what actually gives the parabola its, its unique uh, width and shape and the way it's supposed to uh, focus. Okay, now you can tell from an equation in standard form uh, whether it's going to be vertical or horizontal. The, the um, coordinate that's being squared, in this case x squared, is the axis that is parallel to the directrix. So in other words, the, their focus is here. The directrix would be out here somewhere and it's parallel to the x-axis, and that's the variable being squared. Whereas here, y is being squared, and you see my focus would be out here, some line over here would be the, I'm sorry, no, the directrix, would be out here somewhere, and it's parallel to the y-axis. The other coordinate is always going to be something multiplied by the 4p, okay? And then the, the number out here obviously would then give you the width and overall shape of the of the parabola itself okay the h and k in each uh, placement is where the vertex is of your parabola and then like i said the the p is going to give us the the um the actual width of the parabola there and also the director uh the um the direction of opening okay if p is positive it'll either be up or right, and if P is negative, you just reflect that, right? So if P is negative here, it would of course be facing down. If P is negative here, it would of course be facing left. Okay, so um, one thing that is very special about parabolas is something that we call this reflective property, and that is if you have something in the focus. All right, well, there's two different ways. Well, let's say I have a, a light bulb in the focus and there's a, a reflective surface in the shape of this parabola here. Every light beam that comes out from that spot, that focus spot right here, has the special property of no matter which angle it hits the parabola, it's going to be reflected parallel to the, the center symmetry right here. The axis of symmetry cuts the parabola in half and whichever way that's facing, the um, all of the rays coming out from the focus are going to be reflected to being parallel to it. And it has to do with the special shape of the parabola and the way that the tangent lines hit. And whenever, whenever you can draw a tangent line on something, that's always how you're going to get what we call a, an angle of incidence and an angle of reflection on any surface. And uh, the, the tangent lines are perfect on a parabola such that they always cause the, the angle of incidence and reflection to be equal in a way that causes this parallelism here. Vice versa, you can, you can reverse this such that if light were coming into, say, a parabolic mirror or some sort of object like that, right, then all of the light coming in and hitting the parabola this way would also be forced into a focal spot of perfect focus. Um, so, um, two different applications here. One, headlights. If you can imagine a, a paraboloid, something that's rotated uh, in a parabolic shape like this, it'd be like this, would be the shape of the inside of your headlight and the bulb is perfectly positioned at the focal point of that paraboloid such that uh, you get the maximum amount of light coming out of your headlight. Um, the, the light shines and the parabola is that perfect shape that will cause all of the light beams to go straight out rather than scatter. Vice versa, they use parabolic mirrors and telescopes that bring light in and uh, allows them to focus it into one point and to use all of, uh, of the light, all of the, the sight as maximum as possible. Okay, <clears throat> let's get a couple of examples uh, from parabolas here. Let's say I have y squared plus 10y plus 8x plus 1 is equal to 0, okay? 
So then from here, what I would want to do is get it into one of my standard forms. Since I see the y squared, I'm expecting this standard form right here with the y squared. But I need it to be in this uh, pare uh, parentheses squared. And the way this is set up here, it looks like I'm going to have to complete the square on this object, right? So that's the way we're going to start. And then everything else, I'm just going to push over to the other side there. Okay, so then this is what I get. Uh, I have y squared plus 10y, and then it's going to be equal to negative 8x minus 1, right? Because I subtract those two over. To complete the square, I simply take half of the 10 and square it. That's going to give me plus 25. And of course, it's only legal if I add it to both sides. So I'll put my plus 25 here. Then I can factor this side into y plus 5 squared is equal to, now right here, negative 1 plus 25 is going to be 24 with a plus, right? Negative 8x plus 24. I want something with just x here so that it fits the, the formula perfectly. To do that, I'm going to factor the negative 8 out. But of course, that means I'm factoring it out of this also, which is going to give me minus 3. So then from here, I can, have, I can see my standard equation. And I'm going to start just feeding information off of it. And then let's draw a little sketch of it and, um, and put all the information together. The first thing I notice is that my vertex is the point 3, negative 5, right? Because don't forget these are subtractions. The next thing that I'm going to note is that I can figure out my, my P is, which is going to be that focal length, the distance from the vertex to the focus, right? This negative 8 here is telling me that negative 8 is equal to 4 times p. Therefore, negative 2 is equal to p. That's my focal length and, by the way, direction as well. Okay? It's going to be reflected because p is negative. So then, my focus is going to be what point? Well, we know that it's, it's facing left or right because the y is the thing being squared. It's the, it's the left or right uh, pattern here, okay? So my focus is going to be something shifted to my h value. 3 plus negative 2 is 1, negative 5, okay? That's all I did, h plus p, comma k for the focus there. So then, what about my directrix? Got my focus, got my vertex. What about my directrix? Since this is a horizontal parabola, I can expect my directrix to be vertical. And if my directrix is vertical, that means it's going to be x equals some value, okay? Um, so let me, let me throw a couple of formulas on here that, that weren't up here before. Look, the, um, the directrix here is going to be x equals, and remember it's the same distance but on the other side, right? So in this case it's going to be uh, h minus p. And then if you have this kind of parabola, incidentally, uh, directrix, is going to be a, uh, a horizontal line, which means it would be y equals, and instead of k plus p, it'll be uh, the k minus p. Okay? So in this case, my focus is to the left. Because my p is negative, my parabola is opening to the left here. 
which is why it went from three to one, the focus is inside of that curvature. My directrix is gonna have to be on the other side of this thing, so I'll go two in the other direction. Three minus negative two is gonna be five. Let's get a little sketch. Okay, so right here, I'm going to uh, draw in my vertex first. One, two, three, two, three, four, five. Here is my vertex. My focus is at one negative five. So if I were to put that in here, that would be one negative five, which is right here. And then my directrix is x equals five. So I go a couple of more marks this way and I can put my directrix in here. Like so. Okay, so then how am I going to draw this is, is the, the real thing here. If you need to, you can always plug in and find other points. I'm expecting the parabola to be here, okay? So let's plug in a couple of points to help us find the, uh, the locations of this and get a, a, a nicer graph here. Here's what I mean. I'm going to separate off a little bit of space here and do a quick calculation. Um, let's say that I let X be even with the focus. Remember where the focus is uh, right here is my uh, lattice rectum. And the lattice rectum is the, the horizontal line that goes through the focus, okay? So I can expect that to be a, a width of 4P, 2P on either side of the focus here. So let's check that out. If I just let uh, X be one, right? In my equation, uh, I'll use this equation right here, okay? If I let X be one, one minus three like this. That's negative two times negative eight, which is gonna be 16. Square root both sides and I'm getting that y plus five is equal to plus or minus four, which is giving me two separate answers. Either y is gonna be negative five, because I'm gonna to have to subtract, right? Negative five plus four is negative one, or negative 5 minus 4, which is negative 9. Okay, so where does that leave us here? At y equals negative 1, so that would be the point 1, negative 1, that's here. And then, let's see, that's 5, 6, uh, 7, go a little further here, 8, and 9. So right here. Okay, so notice there's a distance of four here and a distance of four here for a total distance of eight, which notice that's the length of 4p. That's my lattice rectum right there. Okay, for this parabola, I found the lattice rectum. So then my parabola shape is going to be something like this. Not the best, okay? In a second, we'll, we'll jump over and I'll show you what it really looks like in GeoGebra. But that's all of the important features that you'd be interested in, the vertex, the focus, the directrix, and possibly the, the points on each end of the lattice rectum for this right here. The lattice rectum would be whenever the coordinate is equal to that of the focus, right? So whatever the coordinate of the focus is that's in parallel with the directrix. That's where your lattice rectum is going to be. Okay, what about this guy right here? What if all you know is a focus and a directrix? 
Well, that's easy enough. That means that we can find the collection of points that are equidistant from both of those, right? Well, let's start by drawing a little picture to help us sort of visualize this thing, right? So here's my, my axes right here. If my directrix is at y equals one, that's gonna be somewhere right here. And my focus is at two negative five. So two negative five is gonna be, you know, somewhere down here like this. Okay, let's think about that then. If my directrix is here and my focus is down here, then the parabola is gonna be facing downward. I'm gonna be expecting a parabola that does this shape right here, give or take some, some artistic licensing there. Okay, to make the equation, I just need two things. I need to know the P and I need to know my uh, vertex, H and K. The vertex is gonna be the point that's exactly in the middle of these two. So if this is at a height of one and this is at a height of negative five, that means the total distance between these two from here to here is six. So that means there's three on this side and three on this side. It has to be in the middle. Well, okay then, that means that my vertex is then going to be uh, still two, comma, and then negative five right here, plus three, because I'm gonna have to go back up to the vertex here, plus three. So negative two for my vertex, uh, y value. And inadvertently, while we were talking about this, we just discovered right here that P is equal to three. Okay, so let's design our equation here. I know that I've got to have an x squared, so it's gonna be like this, right? That's my equation is gonna have this kind of setup here. Uh, it's gonna be x minus two, right, from my uh, vertex here. It's gonna be y minus negative two from my vertex here. And it's gonna be four times p, which is negative three. Uh, I know I put p equals three here. I was a little bit lazy. I should have been more specific. p is negative three because it is facing downward. The focus is uh, under the vertex here. So p is technically negative three. Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit. And my equation is gonna be x minus two squared is equal to negative 12 times y plus two, like so. And this is gonna be my equation here. Okay, and then of course, if you wanted to graph something more specific from there, we could plug in some points, we could find our lattice rectum, so on and so on. Incidentally, uh, the lattice rectum is supposed to be level with the focus, right? So in other words, I would be picking the, um, the y value of the focus and plugging it in, right? For my lattice rectum here, let's go ahead and calculate that since we're already on it. <clears throat> so when y is negative five, right? If I plug that in here, I'll have negative five plus two. which is negative three times negative 12, which gives me x minus two squared equals 36. Notice that comes out really nice. That tells me x minus two is plus or minus six. So which two x values am I gonna get from that? If I add two, two plus six, right? I'm getting x is eight. And then uh, two minus six, right? X is negative four. So I can actually say that uh, the points for my lattice rectum are like this, right? Here's the lattice rectum right here. And the coordinates are negative four, negative five, and uh, eight, negative five right there.
would be the two coordinates of the lattice rectum there. That would be the only other important piece of information that we would really be looking for there uh, for, this, for these kinds of setups. Okay, so let's take a look at these two examples for real in the GeoGebra here. Um, I have the equation y squared plus 10y plus 8x plus 1 equals 0, the first example. And here's the graph that the uh, GeoGebra gives of that. Let's fill in some of the data so that you can see that we're not just uh, blowing smoke around here. Uh, first of all, the vertex 3, negative 5. 3, negative 5 is right here. There's the vertex point. And then the focus, 1, negative 5, right here. Okay, that's our focus. And then uh, the directrix at x equals 5 is this line over here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a point on the equation there, on the graph. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to slide it, but it restricts it to the graph. Okay, so then here what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a perpendicular line through this point to this line. And I'm going to create the intersection point of these two lines. And the reason for that is so that it can show you this point. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off this line. And I'm going to create a segment between these two points. So when I turn that off, you see what's happening is no matter where I slide this, you'll see that I can get the distance from the point to that line. Now if I create another segment from C to B, you'll notice it's the same length. And it's going to be that way no matter where I move this point, right? You can see these two distances are going to stay exactly equal. And it's because I do actually have the focus and the directrix of this actual parabola here. No matter where I move that point, it's going to be equidistant everywhere along this parabola. Okay, and then uh, the lattice rectum is if I type in our line here would be uh, x equals 1. And let me uh, change the, the color on that one so that we can kind of focus in on it here. Okay. Now where that line intersects are two points. Notice these are the two points that we computed in order to actually look at the lattice rectum here. And then if I create a segment between those two points, one last segment here you'll see that it is of length 8 which indeed is what we expected the, uh, the lattice rectum to be. Okay. So let's, um, let's reset here. And let's go to example two. Example two said that we have a focus which is at two negative five so right here and it also said that we have a directrix of y equals 1 so y equals 1 there's the line right here okay so let's see let's turn that into a uh, pink line that will be cute we computed that we had the equation x minus 2 quantity squared is equal to negative 12 times uh, y plus 2. Okay, so then let's take a look at a few things. The, the point right here, the vertex 2, negative 2 that we computed is exactly right. 
Uh, what about the lattice rectum, which should be at y equals negative 5? If I do the intersection points there, you'll see that it is indeed the two points that we computed, uh, the negative 4, negative 5, and the 8, negative 5, that uh, create our uh, lattice rectum here. Right, that's going to be the, this segment right here is the actual lattice rectum that we were doing at the end. Notice the length of it is 12, which is 4 times p. Okay, so this is the parabola that fits that particular focus and uh, directrix. This is that parabola right here. Next, let's discuss ellipses. Ellipses are the mathematical term for ovals, but not just any kind of oval. Ellipses are what circles turn into when you have uh, more than just a center. Ellipses are formed when you have two focal points, and these two focal points are important to the actual curvature of the ellipse, okay? Uh, ellipses are not as uh, flat on the sides as a lot of people think ovals usually are. And the word oval is not as specific as ellipses. So when we say ellipse, we actually mean a certain type of curvature that's still related to being circular, where instead of having uh, the same radius in all directions, you actually have a major axis and a minor axis. The major axis is going to contain two focal points. And the importance of these focal points is this. An ellipse is a collection of points. The actual ellipse itself is the collection of points where the distance from each focal point to the point itself on the ellipse um, is uh, the, the sum of the two distances to the focal points are constant. So in other words, if I'm, if I'm on an ellipse like this, and I pick any random point on the ellipse itself, like if I pick this point over here, the distance to that focal point plus the distance to this focal point is constant. Okay, so if I pick any other point and I add the two distances from the focal points, it's gonna be the same sum every time. It's constant, okay? Um, to show you what uh, that also implies, uh, I have this set up with two suction cups here, and this is actually one way that you can draw a uh, semi-perfect ellipse. I say semi-perfect because nothing's ever 100% perfect, and you know my my stuff is still gonna find a way to mess up sometimes, right? Um, okay, so imagine that these two suction cups are focal points, and uh, this string is gonna represent the distances to each focal point from a location. And you'll notice, so if I, if I add the two distances, right, no matter if I move around it, it's going to add up to be the same total length of string, okay? So when I, when I put the pen taunt up against the string and let it move in, in the different uh, positions, the total string length being constant is going to force me to draw an ellipse with the, with the pen. So let's see if I can make it work uh, correctly here. I'm gonna pull it taut. Okay, so there's half of the ellipse. I need to flip it to the other side here by rotating the, uh, the strings around a little bit here and here. Okay, so notice that what we have here now is a perfect ellipse. Uh, I'd like to say perfect, it has, a, it has a few flaws here, like right here, right? But uh, the thing is, if I take these same two foci, right, these same two points right here, and move them closer but keep the same center, you would actually get a differently shaped ellipse, right? Uh, the, this length right here would, would be able to come out more if I move the focal points. Or, for example, if I move the focal points more outward, 
the ellipse would get uh, shorter and, and wider. If I move the focal points inward, the, the ellipse would become more circular. If I could get these two focal points on top of each other, it would become a circle. Okay, so the ellipse is like an elongated version of the circle where instead of the center being the only important point, I've got these focal points as well. Uh, let me see if I can label them properly as I take the suction cups off here. Looks like about right there. And it's about right there. Okay. Now the distances that are in here are very important. Okay, so if I if I measure all the way across this thing right here, if I measure through the, the center here from the edge, I'm noticing that I'm getting about 16 inches. Okay, so of course the center is going to be the axis that goes through these two and it's halfway. So here's my center right here. And the, the focal lengths here are going to be kind of specific. So it's, I have an eight inch, uh, I'll, uh, I'm gonna just write this down, A is eight inches right here. And by A, I mean the major axis right here. You'll notice that I use A for the length on any of the major axes, okay? Now the, the distance, uh, let me use the smaller one here to make it easier to see. <clears throat> From the center, out to the outer edge looks like four and a half inches so B is 4.5 inches okay and then if I measure this right here it looks like a little bit more than six and a half right it looks like uh, let's see that would be three quarters, that would be an eighth, that would be a sixteenth. Um, so a sixteenth past a half. C is around six and uh, nine sixteenths, which is around that, right? Now, of course, we can compute it. In all of our ellipses, they follow the rule that a squared minus b squared. Don't get this confused with Pythagorean. It has sort of the same origins using triangles to, to build these things, but the, the, um, the focal length is less than the major axis uh, half length, right? So a squared minus b squared is equal to c squared, okay? So let's check that out. a squared is eight squared, 64 minus b squared, 4.5 squared, is 43.75. If I take the square root of that, I get about 6.6, .6, which is a little bit more than uh, six and a half, as we saw. Uh, six plus uh, nine uh, over 16. We, uh, we measured 6.56 here, okay? This is what we measured, uh, six and nine sixteenths. We measured 6.56 inches. And of course, all of these are approximate. I should put approximate on all of these because I was using the, a ruler for all of them, right? But if the, if the A and the B are correct there, then um, it should be around 6.61, which as you can see, it's very, very close to being that, right? Of course, everything is approximate here. Uh, because, you know, the width of the marker and then did I have it exactly lined up through the exact center and whatnot. But as you can see, it does actually follow this relationship, okay? So if you have the center, if you have the focal points, right, then it should obey the, the minor axis length, which is from the center to the, the, sh um, the shorter side. And then the major axis length right here is the center to the longest uh, point out here. And then these points on the very edges are called the, the vertices or the major vertices. 
okay? And I have all of those added in sort of the same way. So the, the ellipses that we'll be looking at are either gonna be the horizontal or the vertical kind. And there's really not much of a difference between them just other than which one of the two variables has the major axis length. And you'll notice that's really the only difference in the equations here. Here Y is over uh, the A and here X is over the A. It just is gonna tell you which way your ellipse is elongated, okay? As your focal length C gets shorter, right? As C gets shorter, the, the foci can actually come in towards the center. Your ellipse actually becomes more and more round like an actual circle. And if the two foci meet at the center, like if they are the same as the center, it actually becomes uh, a circle, okay? Now some of the properties that uh, ellipses are used for in reality are their reflective properties, sort of like parabolas, but in a different way. The reflective property of ellipses works the same way because of the way the tangent line causes equal angles of incidence and reflection, but, um, but you have the interaction of the two focal points, right? The two foci tend to lead to each other. For example, they'll make rooms with elliptical ceilings and elliptical walls, and there will be two points in these certain rooms where uh, people talking, the, the sound waves, follow the, the, the directional paths between the two focal points. So if people are standing in the focal points, they can actually hear each other a lot better than anywhere else in the room. Or another application directly is all of the orbits of planets and suns in the solar system and, and where else are all elliptical orbits. They're actually not circular orbits. Uh, gravity works in such a way that orbits tend to be elliptical. And the thing that you're orbiting, in our case, the Earth orbiting the Sun, uh, the thing that you're orbiting is going to be one of the focal points of the ellipse that you're riding in, okay? Now, our particular orbit is almost circular. It's pretty close, but it's not quite. And our, our Sun is one of the focal points. So there are certain times of the year where Earth is further than other times because our orbit is actually elliptical. Also, there are rules of Kepler's laws having to do with these elliptical, elliptical orbits where it uh, sweeps out areas of the ellipse for equal amounts of time uh, in the year and things like that. That's how they can predict certain uh, phenomena that we have with orbits and stars and comets and things like that. Okay, so some good applications of, the, of ellipses come from their reflective and uh, from their relationship of the foci. So let's look at a couple of examples of ellipses. I have here 25x squared plus 16y squared minus 50x minus 96y minus 231 equals zero. I know that this is an ellipse because I'm looking at the two squared terms here and noticing that they're the same sign, they're both positive, Therefore, I know it's at least an ellipse. It would have been a circle had they been equal uh, coefficients, but they're not. Since the 25 and 16 are not equal, I know it's an ellipse. Now, I don't want to say yet if it's a, uh, a wide or a tall ellipse. Let's get it into standard form first, which means I need to have some completed square pieces, and it needs to be equal to 1. Okay? Let's do that. I'm going to start by regrouping and getting the number out of the way. So I'm gonna have 25, and then that's x squared. Notice if I factor the 25 out, that's gonna give me minus 2x. And then for the y squared, if I pull a 16, right here, that's gonna give me a minus 6y from this. I'll close the parentheses, and that's gonna be equal to 231 that I add to the other side. Okay, so this is the beginning process of completing the square. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the take the half and square it bit. To take half, that's where I know I'm gonna be ending up. Half of two is one. And then one squared, or negative two is negative one, I mean, and negative one squared is one. But when I add one here, I'm adding it in the parentheses which means I'm really adding a 25 to this side. 
So that means I need to balance it out by adding a 25 to the other side over here. Next, I have a plus 16, right? And I'm gonna take half, so that's gonna be negative three and it's squared. But then negative three squared is nine. So I know that I'm actually adding a nine here which really means I'm adding a nine times 16, 144. So I'll balance that out by adding 144 to the other side as well. Okay, so then finishing up the right side, those are gonna add up to 400. So I've got my completed square pieces now, but remember it's gotta be equal to one. So to make that happen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 400 here. So if I divide by 400, that means I'll have to divide by 400 in all of the locations, like so. That then is going to leave me with uh, x minus 1 squared over 16, because it just so happens 16 times 25 is 400 and y minus 3 squared over 25 is equal to 1. Okay, I'm in standard form now, and I'm noticing that the number under the y squared term is larger. So that means I've got this setup, where the a is under the y. Remember, a is going to be my major axis, no matter which way I choose it. For ellipses, that's what we do with ellipses. So that means I'm going to have a tall ellipse, not a wide one, and my A is going to be uh, giving my, my vertices in the Y direction, not the X direction. And then I'm also gonna have my foci up and down in the Y direction from the center. And I can calculate that using my A squared minus B squared equals C squared. So let's do all of those calculations. Let's start with, uh, I know where the center is, right? The center is going to be at 1, 3. Okay, and then my vertices are going to depend on what length my axis is. So right here I'm noticing the 25 is telling me that my A is 5, and the 16 here is telling me that my B is 4. So those are my major and minor axis lengths. Therefore, my major vertices are going to be at 1 comma 3 minus 5 is negative 2, and 3 plus 5, 1 comma 8. Those are going to be my two major vertices that are at the top and bottom of the actual shape. Okay, now what about the foci? Right? Those are going to be inside of the ellipse, and I need to find my, my C length, my focal length, if you will, from the center. And to do that, I'm going to use our uh, little formula here. So A squared is 25 minus B squared, which is 16, is going to be equal to C squared. I'm just setting it up in this little formula here. Okay, so then that tells me that 9 is C squared, which is going to tell me that C is 3. And yeah, I know you could say plus or minus 3, and really that, that kind of makes sense also because it's the two foci that are going in each direction, but honestly we just go with C is 3 because we're just going to call it the focal length from the center. So that means that I'm going to have foci uh, distances of uh, 3 from the center. So 3 minus 3 is at 1, 0. 3 plus 3 is going to give me 1, 6. Okay? So let's kind of get a little idea of what this looks like by sketching it out. So I need my center is at 1, 3. So 1, 1, 2, 3. There's my center right there. My vertices are at 1, negative 2, so let's do a couple of negatives here. There's a vertex. 
and then one eight. So let's do one, two, three, four. I know my axis is a little crooked there. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so then here's the other vertex right there. To help me graph it, I'm also going to consider that I know the B length also. My B is four. So in other words, on either side of the center, left and right, I should be moving four as well. So I'm gonna do one, two, three, four marks this way. Put a little dot, and then one, two, three, four marks this way. Have my little dot there. And my ellipse should look, you know, something like this. Yeah, by hand is, is very, very rough uh, for me. Um, and then my focal points at one zero and one six. So one zero puts a, a focus right here and one six puts the other focus right here. And remember what that means is if I pick any two points, or I'm sorry, any point on the actual ellipse. So if I pick this point right here, let's say, I don't know what the coordinates are. It's something, you know, crazy. And I actually find the distance here and the distance here between the point and the two focal uh, points. That that's always going to add up to be that same uh, length. And as a matter of fact, um, I may have forgotten to mention this. The actual length that you're adding up to every time on these is whatever 2 times A is. The actual length of that. Um, you, you can tell because if you stretch, you know, the, the point all the way to the, the vertex over here, then you get uh, this little piece, uh, this whole length twice. You get this one uh, once, and it adds up to, to 2 times A. Okay? You can, um, you can see that these are always going to add up to that. So if I add up those two distances, you're going to see uh, that they're going to add up, uh, in our case, to, to 10. Right, so if I add these distances, and it's for any point, okay, and that's the same thing on this ellipse that we were just doing a moment ago, right? The the length from the center to the outer edge was eight inches, okay. So double that is sixteen. If I pick any point on this ellipse, and I actually measure these two distances and add them up, they're going to add up to ten inches right, to whatever uh, two times the, the A length is. <clears throat> okay. Now, flip side. What if I have uh, a center, a focus, and a vertex only, and we want to create the equation, let's say, and find the rest of the information that's pertinent here? Okay. Well, in this case, we have uh, the center's important, right? That's gonna be, I already know this part, this much of the equation. I already know x squared over something plus y squared over something equals one. And the reason why I know that already is because I have the center, right? And for my h and k, right? No matter which way you're doing it, if they're both zero, I'm just gonna get x squared and y squared. So I already know this much of my equation. Now let's use this focus and this vertex to figure out the rest. Let's look at a little picture of it. Just a very, very rough picture. You know how my drawings go. So then seven zero right here, I'm gonna put it, just mark it at seven and, uh, and at nine like this and nine zero. This is a focus right here, and this is a vertex right here. And then my center is the origin here, right? So that means that since this is the center, I should have another focus on this other side over here at negative seven, and my other vertex should be at negative nine. Therefore, my ellipse is gonna look, you know, something like this, give or take. What does that mean? 
it means that my C length is seven and my A length is nine. Okay, well, if I know C and I know A, we can calculate B, can't we? A squared minus B squared equals C squared. And from here, I'm going to plug in nine squared is 81, minus B squared is equal to C squared is 49. Okay, so I add the B and I subtract the 49. And I'm getting that 32 is equal to B squared. In other words, the square root of 32 is B. Okay, so whatever, whatever else I draw, the height right here has to be the square root of 32. Uh, which is what, four square root of two also? Uh, something just a little bit bigger, uh, well not a little bit bigger, like midway between five and six, right? It's, it's, uh, it's closer to that upper end there, um, between five and six. Regardless, I know that B squared is now 32. And for my, uh, for my visualization, I just need to know which one of these is A and which one of these is B, right? Since it's a wide um, ellipse, that means my A must be under the X squared. And my A is nine, so A squared is 81. And uh, also, I just figured out what B squared is, right? It's 32, so that would have to be here. And therefore, this is the equation uh, of the ellipse that has that particular uh, information. So let's take a more accurate look at those two examples that we just worked. Um, right here I've got the equation, the 25 x squared plus 16 y squared, blah, 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 blah. And notice here is what that ellipse really looks like. And let's point out a few things. Uh, the center point is at 1, 3, as we stated. Uh, I have the vertices on the major axis at 1, negative 2 and at 1, 8. And I can show you that the foci are at the points um, 1, 6 and 1, 0 by doing this. If I click on the edge here, it will give me a point that's on the curve and I can actually move that point along. Notice that if I do a segment from the foci to here, and then from here to here, right, to that segment. And then let's actually uh, sum both of those up. That's segments F and G. So if I say uh, the sum is equal to um, uh, F plus G. Notice F plus G is 10, which is exactly what I said two times A was, right? And also notice that F and G will change as I change this point right here, but that sum never changes, which is exactly how we're defining these ellipses right here. I'm defining it such that the sum of the distances to those two foci to any point on this edge is always going to be that same two times A. Okay. So let's start fresh. And then let's take a look at the other uh, example. The other example said that we had a center at 0, 0. It said that we had a focus at 7, 0 and a vertex at 9, 0. We came up with the equation uh, x squared divided by 81 plus y squared divided by 32 equals to 1. And notice the ellipse that forms from that is exactly going through that vertex as promised. And it even goes through the other vertex that we uh, stated, the negative 9 vertex. So therefore, if I put the other focus and vertex in, let's see, put these two in, right? And then put a point on the edge, just like we did before 
and then draw my segments from the foci as I did before like so and then actually get a sum f plus g again okay again notice 18 is 2 times a we said a was 9 and no matter where I move the point even though the lengths themselves change their sum is always the the 18 there so those are definitely the focal points and you can see it goes through both of those vertices as promised so this definitely is the uh, the equation of that ellipse lastly we'll finish up our discussion about conic sections um, however brief this is there's you know a whole lot more that we can talk about uh, later in the unit once we have some more ideas about uh, the the aspects of curves that we're going to be talking about and things like that but for this discussion finish up with hyperbolas um, just so that we can have these basic conic structures and ideas a hyperbola is two different curves it's actually one curve um, but it's two pieces uh, that are separate and you either have a horizontal left right piece or you have a vertical up and down uh, two pieces like that okay now the shape of a hyperbola may seem a lot like a parabola but some major differences one the hyperbola is limited within some asymptotic uh, behavior. The hyperbola actually hugs these asymptotes the further out that it goes from the center, whereas a parabola is unbounded and, and goes outward uh, as much as it wants, as it goes upward. Um, also, a parabola has a reflective property where it takes uh, parallel lines and reflects them towards a focus or vice versa takes uh, lines from a focus and turns them into parallel beam uh, type. A hyperbola is a collection of points where if I take the distance from these two focal points inside of the two curves, uh, if I take the, the two distances and subtract them, it's constant kind of like how we did the two distances with the ellipses and added them and it was constant. With a hyperbola, if I take the distances from the two foci that are inside of the curves, the subtraction, the difference between those two distances is always constant for every point uh, on the hyperbola. So unlike the parabola, the parabola turns beams into parallel light or takes uh, parallel lights and turns them into a focal point. A, a hyperbola will tend to take light from one focus and direct it towards the other. So for, an, uh, for example, if I have a, a hyperbolic shaped uh, sort of uh, either lens or mirror or glass or whatever, it would take the, the light from a source, let's say at one focus, and then it would tend to reflect the, um, the, the, the light that comes out the other side towards of the other focus or if you had it like I said like a mirror instead of a lens and light was coming in from an outward source wherever the other focus was depending on the curvature of the hyperbolic nature of the lens it would beam uh, all of it towards the um, the other focus right um, or vice versa if you if you want to talk about having a source coming from some particular direction, it would tend to take all of those things and focus it in towards the other focus. Also, hyperbolas are used in a lot of locating type of algorithms. Since the, dif the difference between these two is constant, okay, um, if you have two different sources of information about a location of something, like um, if, you, if you heard a noise and two different uh, towers, let's say, both heard the same noise, but the, the, the noise hits them at two different times. So in other words, they calculated two different distances from the noise, okay? The, the, uh, the difference between them being constant, you know that the, the source would have to be somewhere on a hyperbolic arc, okay? Or a GPS location, 
Um, if it's only coming from like two satellites like that, it has to be sort of the same idea. Radio location, um, uh, all kinds of other sound locating type of algorithms are going to use hyperbolic arcs to triangulate. Uh, they call it triangulating. It's, it's actually you know bilocating because uh, you have two sources uh, to to calculate where something is. Okay, so hyperbolas have uh, have that particular aspect uh, whenever you're using them in something. <clears throat> so. Uh, what we have with the hyperbola is these collection of points are such that the, the, the difference of the two distances from the foci, foci is always constant, okay? And what you're always going to have is either this kind of hyperbola or this kind, and how you're going to tell the difference is which one of these terms is negative, because that's how you're actually going to know from your equation that it's a hyperbola, and that is... The, 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 between the squares, one will be positive, one will be negative. They'll be opposite in sign, okay? So then, whichever one is negative is the, is the axis that can't be used, in other words. So right here, you'll notice I have a horizontal hyperbola because the x is positive and x is horizontal. Here I have a vertical uh, hyperbola, and notice y is positive, y is the vertical variable, right? Now, all, a lot of the rest of the stuff here is very similar to what we've been talking about. There's a center point, HK, which is just a shift. In this case, the center point is going to be where the two asymptotes meet, and it's directly in the middle of the outside in between the two curves, okay? Not inside of the concavity of the curve. Uh, the center is where the two asymptotes meet, and it's in between the two curves exactly in the center. The vertices are going to be the points that are closest to the center where each of the curves is pivoting and turning in the other direction. So those are going to be your two vertices. And then the, the foci are inside of the concavity of each of your curves. So in this case, notice my C, right, which is the focal distance, is going to be more than A, where A is that distance in between these two. Um, or if it's vertical, notice this time I'm still using B. B is going to be the distance uh, here between those two as well. Okay, so um, the other thing that, that makes it easy for us to draw these is we actually go ahead and calculate these two asymptotes that dictate the, the outer shapes of these guys. So to draw a hyperbola, it's usually pretty easy if you can locate a vertex and the two asymptotes, because you just hug the asymptotes and turn on the vertex. And you can usually um, fit the, the curve in pretty well from that. Okay, for the focal length, notice it looks exactly like the Pythagorean theorem. And that's actually where it, it comes from when you're, when you're uh, setting up the formula, it ends up being a right triangle with the A, B, and C in there. Uh, if you set it up the right way. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And of course, I'm getting a and b from here. Um, we do technically have a major and minor axis, but really what we have is a used axis and an unused axis, okay? Um, but the, the a and the b uh, are going to always, a in, this, in the case of a hyperbola, a is always going to come with x, b is always going to come with y. That's just to keep our, our formulas straight here, because you'll notice I'm using the B and A as the slope for the asymptotes. Uh, I'm also using B and A for the X and Y value uh, shifts for the vertices, okay? So you can see that the formulas are the same, and that's because I don't interchange the A and B when it comes to which variable they go with, okay? With the ellipse, it mattered because whichever one was larger became the major axis. With a hyperbola, you know which one is the used axis because of what's positive and what's negative. So as soon as I can see uh, which way I'm going to be going from the positive and negative, I simply find out what my A and B are, and then I know to calculate either the A if it's horizontal or the B if it's vertical to find those vertices, right? See, I have plus or minus B or plus or minus A just depending on which dimension you're adding in. 
and then C is going to be calculated, you know, for your focal length, uh, and then you'll um, you'll add it to the appropriate uh, dimension, either X or, or Y. Okay, so let's jump in and actually do a couple of examples of these here. So I'm looking at this conic equation here, and I'm seeing uh, the x squared and the y squared there, and I'm noticing they're opposite in sign. That means I've got a hyperbola on my hands. Okay, so just like with the ellipse, I want to get it into this format where I have the squared ratios, right? And then it's equal to 1, right? Equal to 1 for my ratios here. So step one with that is, I'm going to want to get the number away, and I'm going to want to start completing the square on these things here. Okay, so for x squared, I'll peel out a negative 9. And to do that, notice uh, taking a negative 9 out of here leaves me with plus 8x. Next, for the y squared, I'm going to pull out a 25. That's going to leave me with 4y. I'm going to close my parentheses, and I'm adding the 269 uh, to the other side there. Okay, so I've got all that stuff organized. I know that I'm going to be doing this for the next step. Right, I'm going to be completing the square on these things. So then let's fill those in. Half of 8 is 4. 4 squared is 16. Half of 4 is 2. 2 squared is 4. All right. And then think about this. What am I actually putting on each side, right? This one's easy. 25 times 4. I'm adding 100 here. So that means I need to add 100 here. Here I've got 9 times 16. It's negative, though. So that's a negative 144. I'm actually subtracting 144 from the left side. So I'm going to also do that same thing here, like so. So then after doing all of the combining here, right, the 100 minus 144 gives me negative 44, which is going to give me 225 here. Okay, and I want to have a 1 on this side, so I'm just going to divide everything by 225, right? I'm going to divide by 225, divide by 225, divide by 225. And where that lands me is a negative x plus 4 squared over 25 plus y plus 2 squared over 9 is equal to 1. So I've got my hyperbola equation, and I'm noticing that the x is the negative here. And again, don't assume just from the beginning which one it's going to be. I know it's going to be a hyperbola, but I didn't know if it was going to be the x or the y. And the reason for that is this 225 could easily have come up to be negative. And when I divide to get the 1, it would switch the, the signs on it. Okay, so at the very end, now I decide, okay, y squared has the positive, x squared has the negative. That means I've got a vertical hyperbola here. So I've got this one to deal with on this particular instance. I know my center is going to be negative 4, negative 2. Right? And then my A is 5, and my B is 3. So I can easily calculate what my C value is going to be. C squared is going to be 25 plus 9. Okay, so then C is going to be square root of 34. Okay. So I've got my center, I've got my A, B, and C lengths. Let's go ahead and write up the rest of the important points here. From the center, I'll go ahead and squeeze in the other two here. 
right? A is five, B is three. And I've got my A, B, and C there. So then my vertices, Remember, this is a vertical hyperbola, right? So I'll be going up and down. That means both of my vertices are gonna have the same x coordinate of negative four. But now I'll be adding and subtracting three for the vertices because b is always the, the vertical component in both of these, okay? So b right here being three means that I'm going to add 3 and get 1, and subtract 3 and get negative 5. Right? And then my foci, let me go ahead and box these in for us. There's my center, there's my vertices, right? Okay, my focal points are going to be negative 4, and negative two plus the square root of 34, and negative four, negative two minus the square root of 34. Okay, so I've got my foci there. If nothing else, but by representation. And of course, um, when you're graphing this thing, you're going to want to have those decimal forms so that you can try to put them in a pretty decent spot on the graph. Okay, so I've got negative two plus square root of 34, 3.83, 3.83, and then negative two minus the square root of 34, negative 7.83, that'll work. Okay, so let's throw a little grid up here and see if we can't draw a decent graph of one of these things. Okay, so let me move this out of the way. Make a little space here. My center is at negative four, negative two. So one, two, three, four, one, two. And here's my center. Now remember, the center is just the point in between the two curves, okay? So then what I'm gonna do from there is I'm going to graph the vertices, negative four, one, and negative four, negative five. And then I'm going to pull another trick that isn't on these two things here uh, to help me draw the asymptotes. So uh, negative 4, 1, I have right here. And negative 4, whoops, 1, 2, 3, yeah, uh, 1, 2, Three. Okay. Seems about right. Seems pretty close. Okay. So now here's the thing. I know my A value is five and my B value is three, right? So what I'll need to do is go ahead and count that out. One, two, three, four, five in that direction. And one, two, three, or five in this direction. And then I've got the top and bottom up three and down three, right? Because here's my, here's my center right there. So here's what you do from this point. I know that my curves are gonna be going through these points, all right? My curve is gonna be here and my curve is gonna be here. What I need is to have these asymptotes drawn so that I can hug them efficiently and go through the, the question point. Uh, vert vertex for each one, okay? So here's the maneuver that we're gonna use. Uh, I'm gonna draw a box, 
and the box's corners will be points on the asymptotes, okay? Here, let me show you why. If I draw the box so that it fits uh, the maximum B up and down and the maximum A left and right. So for, for B up and down, remember we hit the vertex here. And if I go A, that's five in this direction and five in that direction. So that's gonna look like this to here. Same thing for this one. It's gonna go through this point to there. And then I connect. And then same thing over here. It's gonna be up to this point and to this point. To here. Okay, now what does this box do? Remember, I'm gonna be drawing my asymptotes from this box. The asymptotes are supposed to have slope of B over A, and they're shifted to the same center, H and K, right? They go through the center. So don't worry about the H and K part. The slope, the B over A slope, that's where this box comes in real handy because from the center, I'll be going up B and over A, or up B and over A, or down B and over A, or down B and over A this way, okay? So notice the corners of each of the, each of the corners here are going to be points that are on the asymptotes. So what I do is I just connect the corners through the center and keep drawing, right? So if I've got a semi-decent straight edge here, which I hope this is. Oh wait, let me get a better marker. Okay, so I, I put my straight edge through the corners here, like so. And there's one of my asymptotes right there. And then the same thing for the other guy right here. Through the center from corner to corner. I draw the asymptotes in. Okay, now once I have these asymptotes in there, then I basically have the outside shapes, right? The, the extremities of the hyperbola. The hyperbola has to fit. Now here's the beautiful part. Whether it's a horizontal or a vertical, this is the exact same trick because the, the vertices, if it were horizontal, would be here in the box and here in the box. But this time, since I have a vertical one, my vertices are here and here, okay? So then what I'll be drawing, the actual hyperbola here, all I'll be doing is hugging the asymptote here until I get close to the vertex. And then if I don't screw it up like I just did, um, I go straight into the vertex like this. And then the same thing, I come back out and I go back out like that. And there's my hyperbola top piece. So then here, same thing, right? I hug the asymptote till I hit the vertex here and then skirt on out hit the asymptote here. Well, don't hit it, but skirt it this way. And there's the actual graph of the hyperbola, if, as long as my um, tick marks are pretty well on, okay? The box helps me draw the asymptotes because it guarantees the correct slope of up B and over A, right? If I, if I needed to write down the equations of these asymptotes, Okay, then the top one here 
is y is equal to, and that's the positive slope, right? My b is 3, my a is 5. So that's going to be 3 fifths x uh, plus, that's going to be the same as this, plus 4, and then minus 2. And then this asymptote down here would be y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 4 minus 2. And of course, if you wanted to simplify them from there by distributing the 3 fifths and then combining with the negative 2, that's fine also. Um, basically, what I have is a, uh, an extended version of the point-slope form of these lines. Uh, and that's what really matters is that I, I can write an equation for those two asymptotes if needed. Okay? But for me, it's always been the easiest way is to, is to have the, the box, the AB box uh, for those. Okay. Now what about the foci? The focal points are going to be those points where I've calculated these, right? Negative 4 and then 3.8. Okay. So notice this is 1 where we're at with the vertex right here. So 2 is probably somewhere close to where it goes through there. And then 3 and then 4. So somewhere between three and four there, really close, the focal point is like way up here. And then same thing in the other direction, right? It's supposed to be a negative 7.8. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six is gonna be somewhere close to where it goes through uh, seven and then eight. My focal point's gonna be right in between those two, somewhere about right here. Okay, and the whole idea of the focal points on the hyperbola, don't forget, are if I pick any point, like if, say if I pick this point over here, then the distance to this minus the distance to this is a constant, right? That's the, uh, that's the hyperbola there. Okay, just like the other ones, in reverse, what if I know some information, like if I know the focal points, like if I were doing some geolocating with uh, radio waves or something like that, I would know the focal points because these would be the, the towers measuring the distances. And so if I know the, the focal points, then all I would need to know is just a little bit uh, more information, like where is one of the vertices or, or something like that, just so that I can get a, uh, a perspective on like an A value or whatever, okay? Here, we're given two vertices and one focus and asked to create the equation of this particular uh, hyperbola, okay? So let's just get a feel for it by drawing a very rough sketch of these points, all right? So zero, four is gonna be on the axis. Six, four, oh, wrong axis, David. Zero, four is gonna be on this axis right here. Uh, six, four is gonna be out here. And then eight, four is gonna be like right there. Okay, so I've got, this is at six and this is at eight. And all of these are at four high. Okay, so then both of these are vertices. So in other words, you can imagine your, your hyperbola doing something like this and something like this. And I've got one of the focal points here, like that, right? I've got one of the focal points. I can easily find the center because the center has to literally be the center, right? It's gonna be the halfway point in between the two vertices, right? So cut the difference here. It's between zero and six. Obviously the center must be at three. So my center in this case, and of course if it's not obvious, you could always take the two x coordinates and average them. That's how you find the middle of two numbers. You just average them. Uh, in this case, my center is three, four, okay? Well, we've already got a good bit of information there, right? I can tell because of the way uh, the focus is pointing 
that this is going to be a horizontal, a left-right hyperbola. So then my equation would have to be uh, x minus 3 squared uh, over something minus y minus 4 squared over something and then equal to 1. Okay? Now, I know the length from the center out to a vertex, right? My center is here, and the distance out to one of the vertices is 3. That's my x direction right there, okay? So because I know this distance right here from the center to one of the vertices, uh, that gives me my a value is 3. So if my a value is 3, then this is going to be x minus 3 squared over 3 squared, right, over 9. Next, I need to find the b value. And remember, the b value is sort of hidden in the graph here. The b value would be if I were to draw the box in and have the actual asymptotes that are going in between these two, right? It would be the corners of that. I didn't go through the center. I, I did a piss poor job there that I apologize. Um, it would be my asymptotes there, right? Um, so I need to know the B value. In other words, this, this height right here. But we can just calculate that. We can calculate the B value using our A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So A squared, right? That's 9 plus B squared is equal to C squared. Now, I need to know what C is, right? C is going to be the distance from the center out to one of the focal points. Well, that's the distance from 3 to 8. So in other words, C must be 5. So 25. 9 plus B squared is equal to 25. So if I subtract 9 from both sides, B squared is then 16, which tells me that B is 4. And then once we have this information, I could actually draw a much more appropriate graph, but we just needed the visual so that you could see where I'm getting these values from for A and C. Um, B squared is 16. Therefore, this is going to be the rest of my equation here. And then, of course, you can answer any other uh, uh, questions like, where's the other focal point, right? The other focus. Well, since my focal length is 5 from the center, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So then the other focus must be at negative 2 comma 4, right? It's going to be over here, over there, right? And then what about asymptotes? We could easily write down the equations of the asymptotes. asymptotes would be y is equal to plus or minus b over a. b is 4, a is 3. So 4 thirds x minus 3 uh, plus 4. Okay? So I hope this lecture has given you an insight into some very special curves that have many, many useful applications that you may or may not have heard about a lot up until this point. But we will definitely be seeing them a lot in this unit when we start talking about the generic um, field of curves that we need to discuss and the generalization of our idea of what a function is for all of the curves in 2D and eventually 3D space. Um, we're, we're on that staircase now to build up to multivariable calculus. That's where this is escalating up to. And by the end of calculus two here, uh, multivariable calculus is right there waiting for you. Okay. Let's close out by looking at these two examples in a more accurate sense here in GeoGebra. So I have that first example up there, negative nine X squared plus 25 Y squared and all the rest. It's a hyperbola looking like so. 
and let's label a few of those important structures. For example, the center being at negative 4, negative 2. Um, you can see it a little bit better if I move it over like this. That's definitely the center. And then I have vertices at negative 4, 1 and negative 4, negative 5. And then my foci are going to be, uh, I'm going to have to actually type them in separately here. So I'm just going to put the two points and then I'm going to type it in here. So foci number 1 is negative 4 and negative 2 plus the square root of 34. OK, why is it doing a point there? OK, good. And then the other one here, foci number 2, is at negative 4 and negative 2 minus the square root of 34. Okay, so now I have my two foci there. Let's talk about what it means for a hyperbola to have those foci. If I pick a, a point somewhere on the hyperbola, like let's say this point right here, and then I take the lengths from each foci. And then I do the difference of those. The difference in this case would be, um, well, I'm just going to take the, the absolute value of f minus g here. Notice that absolute value is equal to 6. And look at what happens no matter where I move this along the hyperbola. Right? The distances themselves, f and g, change. But you'll notice that the difference between them never does. And that's actually how we're defining a hyperbola here. It's the collection of points where the distances, uh, the difference of the distances from the two foci is constant. Right? Okay, and um, another thing to note, the, uh, the distance between the center and the uh, vertices here is 3, and that difference is twice that. Okay, let's start fresh. And remember with the second example, we started with three points. We had a vertex at... 0, 4. We had another vertex at 6, 4. And then we had a focus, one of my two foci, at 8, 4. Okay, and then from this information, we computed that the hyperbola that has these two vertices and that as a focus was the equation of x minus 3 squared over 9 plus, whoops, I forgot my negative, plus y minus 4 quantity squared uh, over 16. Whoops, I got my pluses and minuses uh, backwards here. Let me just fix that. It was a minus on the y and a positive on the x. Uh, equals 1. Okay, so look, there's our hyperbola right there, and notice it does actually hit those two vertices. And if this truly is the focus, uh, notice the focal difference here. Uh, being just a difference of two would mean that I would have to have my other focus at the uh, negative 2, 4, which we, we actually did state in the problem. 
and to go ahead and make sure that this is the uh, the hyperbola that has those two foci and those vertices let me just pick a point on the hyperbola and construct the um, the distances and then do the difference uh, as the absolute value of f minus g there okay so then again notice no matter where I move this point on the hyperbola and it would be the same on the uh, on the other side as well right no matter where I move this uh, on the hyperbola the um, the difference between those two is constant right 100 percent constant uh, by coincidence again uh, notice our um, our vertex distance is again three right you can see because our center is at uh, 3 4 here the um, if I move this point in line you can see from here the total difference of the distances being 6 uh, is because of this this again like being 3